that'll jog your memory. When you start reminding yourself when he was faithful and you were not. Woo. Mm. I said when you were faith when he was faithful and you were not. That's right, Pastor. And he was still willing to love you. How many car wrecks were you saved from death or personal bodily injury because mama was praying for you? How many times when you were drunk on the way home should you have been arrested and thrown into prison? But God miraculously intervened and said, but I'm, I've got a calling on that person's life. How many times was your marriage almost over? God says, but I remember the prayers when you were faithful. And I remember the vow you made. And, and I'm going to honor my end and I'm going to help you to honor yours. Think about it. somebody it's about the bus down Lord will you worship you Lord you're worthy of all praise and glory and honor we want you to manifest your presence in this building God I'm not good enough I'm not smart enough I'm not talented enough to minister to this congregation we need you to manifest stuff worked up by people and by music. We've, we've grown accustomed to being set up by music. And if a certain guy comes through, it's one of our favorites, and he preaches our favorite message, we, we think it's the Holy Ghost, but really it's an emotional stir. So what the church has been starving for is not another great evangelist or another new song. They've been starving for the presence of Almighty God. I'm going to tell you, church, that presence of God is here. You can't manufacture it. You can't hypnotically affect a congregation to think he's here. It's real. It's him. And we worship him for he's holy. My God, we bless your name. We want you to do everything you desire today. We are your people called by your name. You make our hearts one with yours. That you will speak to us this morning. You will build our faith, increase our faith. Help us, God, to march out of this building with boldness of your spirit and to change this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you. Come on, turn to somebody and say, God loves you. That might be the encouragement they need this morning. God loves you. Isn't it good to be in the Lord's house? Hallelujah. This morning, I've got a very encouraging message. More than conquerors. I'm talking about you. 
you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. We're going to begin with Romans chapter 8. We'll start with verse 31. I'm going to read through several verses from this chapter. But verse 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I want you to say those last words. If God is for us, who can be against us? Look at somebody nearby and say those words again. If God be for us, who can be against us? I want you to stretch your hand this way and let's believe God to anoint his messenger today. Spirit of God, your word all by itself is powerful. But I ask, Lord, that in this next few, these next few minutes, God, you will anoint your messenger. Lord, that I will prepare this bread and deliver it in the proper fashion. And that it will be anointed, that we will receive it with open hearts. And that, God, our faith will truly arise today. And let us be reminded we are more than conquerors through you. In Jesus' name, amen. When Paul wrote the words in Romans, he was not saying that no one would oppose us. He was just saying that no matter who it is that shows up on the opposition side, you ain't got to worry about them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And if God be for you, who can be against you? There's a lot of things that come against us, and, and we get, I call it getting up in a tizzy, get all upset. Some of the things that come against us are uh, maybe people would say, your bills are stacking up, and there's no way you're going to be able to pay. But that's when you turn around and say, but God is for me. Amen. Some would say, well, you're never going to find the wife or the husband uh, just because everybody knows how you are, and, 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 and you're never going to find anybody that's going to love you and put up with you. You say, well, that may be your, your opinion, but... My Bible says God is for me. Oh, hallelujah. Some people would say, well, your past is too bad. You could never be used again in ministry. There's no one even going to listen to you. You've sinned too much. Well, guess what, devil? My sins have been as, uh, removed from me as far as the east is from the west. You might not be for me, but my God is. Oh, hallelujah. Some people would say your biblical point of view is outdated. Your biblical morality is in the past. Holiness is something we don't need anymore. You'd say, well, that might be your opinion. But my God says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word will not change. Therefore, if God is for me, who can be against me? Some would say now that you're married with children, you should just accept the fact that you're never going to get a better career. You'll never be able to go back to college. Just, uh, just deal with life. But you'd say, you know what? If God's for me and he pushes me to go into another career and get me another degree, if he blesses me in that direction, if he's for me, who can be against me? Let's go on with verse 32. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? I looked up the meaning of the word distress. The stress comes from the Greek word stenokoria, meaning a narrow place. I bet there's somebody in this room that's felt like the world's closed in on you at times. I bet there's times where you had friends and you thought they were your friends and then they ganged up with other people and, and started talking bad about you and you felt like you, the squeeze was being put on you and you thought, man, I don't know who I can trust anymore and you felt like you was being closed in. A lot of times... We'll be in situations of, of uh, dealing with people at work and it's, it feels like everybody's starting to turn against us and you get on the black ball list as they would refer to it and now you're the, the one everybody's trying to bump out and get them fired and that's not a comfortable place. It's in a narrow place. The Bible tells us that even distress will not separate us from the love of God. Exodus thirty three eighteen is a perfect story that relates to distress in a narrow place Moses spoke to God and he said please show me your glory God answered Moses prayer but it wasn't quite the way he thought because when we go to Exodus 33 
21 through 23. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Brother Neil Finley, Brother Randy Goble, y'all come stand up here. Tell you what, let's, let's stand over here. I've got to get to where my mic won't feed back, so y'all both come about right here. And face outward like you face that way. Randy, you face that way. Y'all close in a little bit on me. This could be interesting. <laughs> Hallelujah. Pancakes and sausage for breakfast, anybody? <laughs> hey, y'all doing a good job. Y'all doing a good job. Moses, okay, young, young, ease up just a little. Hallelujah. <laughs> Moses got in a tight place. Now, this is odd because he said, God, show me your glory. I mean, what a request. This is something that you'd put at the top of the charts when it comes to prayer requests. You're not asking for God to heal your sister. God, touch mama. God, help me get a better job. No, he said, God, I've been up here for days. I've fasted. I've prayed. I've got away from the world. And there's one thing within me I desire more than anything else. Heavenly Father, I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. And of all the things God could have done, I, now if it were me, I could picture something where he brings up a huge host of angels. And you'd, you know that Aladdin, uh, the genie, uh, play, played by Robin Williams. Anybody ever seen Aladdin, the Disney movie? And, and he brings out, he can just make stuff appear and you got all these cheering in a band section. I kind of picture God doing that kind of thing. When he says, show me your glory, I can see God just bringing up five million angels. And here's a gigantic spotlight. He, he turns the sun in angles and it's like, bam! And, and everything's just mind-blowing. But no, God did not do that because that's what a human would have expected when Moses said show me your glory God did the most unexpected thing he took Moses and it said he stuck him in the middle in the cleft of the rock oh we're gonna go somewhere right here hallelujah because see here's what happens when you're in the cleft of the rock uh, God is now able to control what you're looking at <laughs> Hallelujah. Holy Ghost might jump off on some of these men up here if they ain't careful. Um, because here's what I see. When God stuck Moses in the cleft of the rock, he was saying, when you were outside, when you were free to roam, you could easily be distracted by everything else going on. You might notice a star. You might look up and see the sun. You might look down and see a big party going on at the bottom of the mountain. But he said, if you really want to see my glory, i got to put you in a place where I am in complete control of the vision. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. You see, when I get in a narrow place, my focus is drawn to things I never would have seen before. I guarantee you, you go home today and you put your chair in the corner of your bedroom. Sit in that chair. Don't look at anything else in the bedroom, but just look at within about a six square foot span and you'll find things you didn't even know were there. Because when you're put in a tight spot and you're able to focus on things that you normally just walk right by to grab your clothes out of the drawer, to go to the restroom or make up your bed, but, but when you focus on that area you don't ever look at, you're going to find things you didn't know existed. God says, I've got to put you in a place that is so tight that you can't even turn your head unless I'm turning it. Where you can't even take one step unless I'm giving you the power and the release to take one step. See, there's been some of us that have been roaming a little bit too free. It's been, if you're in the gaming market, you like games, it's kind of, it's called open game, uh, where the, or, or, or uh, the environment's open, you can go anywhere you want to. A lot of people like playing games like that, but see, too many Christians get in that mindset with God because we just want everything to be open and be able to touch and feel and experience whatever we want but God says see here's where you've been missing it in order to experience my glory I've got to put the squeeze on you I've got to get you in a place where you're not comfortable anymore I got to put you in a place where people aren't cheering your name and saying what an anointed minister of God you are I've got to take you away from the spotlight and put you in a dark place so that the only light you see is me y'all have a seat thank you y'all give them a hand God's got to have you in a place, if he's going to show you your glo his glory, where he's in complete control of the vision. Now, another thing that caught Moses by surprise was instead of God showing him all his glory, God said, I'm going to walk by you and cover that tight place with my hand. 
Once again, controlling what, God, what Moses was able to experience. And when he passed by, he said, I'll remove my hand and I will show you the hinder parts or what is behind me. That wasn't what Moses expected, but it was what, God, what Moses needed God to show him. When you ask God to show you his glory, be prepared to be placed in a narrow place. Be prepared for it to feel like work squeezing on you a little tighter. Be prepared for relationships to get a little rocky sometimes, but you're still going to make it. Be prepared for the kids to go a little nuts sometimes, and you think, man, they, they turn into a different child. What's going on? But what, what's happening is it seems like all these things are hitting at once because God's allowing you to get into a tight place to where you will no longer feel in control, and the only control that anybody has has is God's control puts you in a place where he can control the vision who shall separate us verse 35 who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution how many has ever heard of R.W. Shambach the minister evangelist I was listening this morning is, is he already gone on to be with the Lord, y'all? I, I thought he had. I, was, I went on YouTube and I pulled up a video. And as he was speaking, this was around 1994. He said that there was a time God called him to Chicago and he ran a revival there and they had rented a theater and were using it and God was moving miraculously. Now he said there began to be a jealousy among the churches. Because what was happening was they were getting, the, these people getting saved were getting the real Jesus. <laughs> they were getting real sanctification. They were really getting healed. They were really getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. And when the members were going back to the churches, it was upsetting the churches because they realized there, a fire had been lit that they could not put out with ritual or tradition. So what happened? Believe it or not. The religious leaders of Chicago came together and began to uh, protest against this move of God in the theater. I don't know if they held up signs or what, but I know they, they gathered in a large group and they were protesting against the man of God, R.W. Shambach. So word got to the mayor and he was impressed, or, or I guess you'd say he gave in to the pressures of the people. And he called the head electrician of the city and said, I want you, or whoever was working with the power company, he said, I want you to go to that theater and cut off all the power. We'll shut this thing down. So R.W. Schambach shows up, said there's about 3,000 people standing outside waiting to get in. They said, Pastor, we, or, or brother, we can't get in there. The power's off. There's no heating in there. There's no lights. We can't even have service. A woman comes walking up to him. Barely able to walk. She says, Brother Shambach. She says, I don't know what I'm going to do. She said, there's no lights in there. You've heard the people. There's a crowd out here. And <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to get my healing. I've been crippled for years. And, and, and if we're not able to have church tonight, I'm going to have to go back home and live the rest of my life the way I always have. He said, Sister. He said, God's not a God just of that building. He's a God of the sidewalk. He said, I'm going to lay hands on you, and God's going to heal you right now. He laid hands on that woman. God touched her body. Now, here's where it gets, gets interesting. He said, while he was praying, three policemen grabbed him by the arm and threw him into, he called it a paddy wagon. It was like a police van. <coughs> threw him into a police van. Hauled him off. He was saying, why am I being taken off? What's the charge? They said, you don't have a license to preach on a street corner in Chicago. We're taking you to jail. He begins to get very concerned. Wait a minute, God. Don't you realize what's happening? This is Chicago. It's going to be all over the news. This is going to kill my ministry. Nobody's going to have me to come to uh, preach at their church anymore because I, I'm, I've been arrested. I've got a record. He's complaining, he's arguing, he's, he's asking God, what's the problem here? What's going to happen? And, and he said that before they drove off, he said the worship leader was there leading in worship. He, he's the song leader. And they went ahead and grabbed him too, threw him in the paddy wagon. And Brother Shambach said, well, hallelujah. He said, now I won't be alone because he said one could put a thousand to plot, but he said two will send 10,000 running. <laughs> So him here, here, him and his worship leader go hauled off to the jailhouse. 
They get out on bail, show up the next day at the courthouse. Brother Shambach said he's walking down the hall of, of the courthouse and he begins hearing a sound coming from the courtroom he's supposed to be going to and he hears, sounds like somebody, oh, hallelujah, somebody's speaking in tongues. In public. It wasn't just one, it wasn't just two, it wasn't just three, it was as many as could pack into that courtroom. He said the closer they got, he looked over at his wife and he said, oh, this is going to be good. He said, something good's happening in there. When they opened the doors, there was an entire crowd of Pentecostal, Holy Ghost filled people speaking in other tongues, praying for a miracle. He walks up there, the judge comes in. The judge says, we're going to have to call a 15 minute recess and hope that things settle down. He said, your honor, if I may say, he said, if you wait 15 minutes, you won't ever get control of this courtroom again. He said, we're going to have church right here. The judge says, all right, we'll proceed. When they start the proceedings uh, out of what is the norm, he said, here comes a woman walking into the door. She walks up to Brother Shambach. Now, this sounds so funny because, you know, normally they're going to throw you out if you do something like this, but God had given her favor. She walked in there and she said, Brother Shambach, she says, I've got to tell you something. She says, I was in a hospital this morning. They told me I had kidney failure. They said that they're going to have to operate and remove my kidneys. I'm going on dialysis. But I, I, I got a newspaper, oh, hallelujah, delivered to my room this morning, and you were on the front page. I saw R.W. Shambach arrested and placed in jail, and I knew I had to get down here. I unhooked every IV. I got rid of all that, that hospital garment, put on my clothes, and says, I'm sign me out. I'm going to see the man of God. She walked up there she said, Brother Shamba, right in the middle of the courtroom, you've got to pray for me right now. He said, lady, don't you realize the whole reason I'm here is because of stuff like this? You just go sit down, we'll talk after. She said, wait a minute. She said, God called you for such a time as this. God, she said, if it takes it, go ahead and get arrested a second time. But you were called to lay hands on the sick and they would recover. He said, all right, ma'am. Judge, everybody else is watching. He lays hands on that woman. The Holy Ghost hits her, heals her body, fills her, moves with the Holy Ghost. The judge picks up the gavel, says, case closed. We're going to the house. God did a miracle. Now, I'm not saying that every situation ends up like that. But I'll tell you this, whether you get thrown in prison for 30 years or whether God miraculously intervenes on the first day, if God be for you, who can be against you? Oh, yeah, go ahead and give him a hand. Hallelujah. Shall, trouble, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness. You know, when I think about nakedness, that seems odd. Why would he, the minister, why would the apostle even say nakedness won't separate you from the love of God? I believe there was a hidden thought here. And I'm just talking of physical nakedness. I believe that Paul was trying to let you know that when everything is revealed and laid bare before God, it still won't separate you from his love. When he sees you at your worst, it won't separate you from his love. When he sees you with everything exposed that brings shame to you and you wish nobody ever knew about some of the things you did, but God was with you every time you sinned. God was with you every time you failed. Didn't matter if you was with a crowd or you was by yourself. God was there. He knew it, but here's the thing. He said even when your nakedness, when your, when your failure, when your past, when everything's exposed, it will not separate you from the love of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. What about peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are all killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. When I think of conquerors, I think of people like Napoleon. I think of uh, Constantine. Think of Alexander the Great from Greece and how he took Europe by storm. I, I, I think of many leaders who were powerful and had mighty militaries. But of all those great conquerors, I never remember hearing any of them referred to as more than a conqueror. Mm. You see, I looked up the word more than. The word's more than. It comes from the Greek, hypernikeo, meaning to gain a surpassive, surpassing victory. 
You know what that means, church? I hope next time you hear more than conquerors, you always remember this. It means your victory has already gone beyond this battle. Oh, it means your victory has already surpassed this fight. See, the enemy's having to bolster up his defenses about 10 years down the road because according to God's word, you've already won these battles in his mind. You've already become more than a conqueror. Yes, you're going to win this battle, but quit just quit shouting the victory over this last fight you just won. Shout the victory because God's done promised you victory until he comes back for you. Woo, hallelujah. My Lord, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost today. Hallelujah. I tell you what, God has given you victory where you are more than, more than, more than, far surpassing this victory. His victory in you goes beyond any battle you've faced and any that you're going to face in the near future. It reaches into eternity. When God spoke to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 7, He gave instructions that are still good for today. Beginning with verse 1, When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, I want to stop there, we are not neighbors with the devil. Amen? We're not to treat him neighborly. The Bible said, love your neighbor as yourself. He was not talking about Satan. So quit treating him like he's a neighbor. Quit treating him like he's somebody we need to pat on the head and we need to pacify and we need to pay a fee like they do to mafia in, in certain big cities just to have a business. Here's the real deal when it comes to serving God. When you are the church that God's called you to be, when you are the Christian God's called you to be, it will affect your environment. Instead of being concerned about upsetting the devil, you will go out with all your might under his leading and you'll put the devil to flight. Here's some of the things that will happen when a church rises up and does the job God called them to do. Number one, bars will begin closing down in cities. I remember a story of a lady. Her name slips my mind. Brother Jeffrey Rogers told me about this lady. But I remember she was down at Talladega. And he, he told me of how uh, she was starting a tent revival. I didn't even plan to share this. And, and, and you can tell because I don't have all the facts, the city names and all, but it was in Alabama. And I remember he said that she started this revival in somebody's yard that was in town. And they set up a tent and started having great moves of God. Matter of fact, it was so powerful that the bar down the road started losing business, emptying out because people were getting the good, the new wine, the Holy Ghost type of intoxication that does not leave you the next morning, doesn't leave you with a, a hangover, hallelujah. So the bar manager, the owner, got mad. And he sent his bouncer down there and he talked to the sister. And he says, you're going to shut down this revival you're hurting my business. I'll give you one warning. That's all you get. Well, guess what she did? She went to the throne room. She started praying, Lord God, you sent me here. Lord God, I know this is your will. Lord God, people's being saved, transformed, sanctified, delivered, filled with the Holy Ghost, healed. God, it's got to be your will. So the more she prayed, the more she felt a security and a, a, a unction of the Lord. Keep going with what you're doing. A few nights later, the bar owner himself shows up. He's sitting in the tent in that person's yard. And, and that sister said that when she stood up, she began preaching under the anointed power of the Holy Ghost. That bar member stood up and he said, don't say another word about your Jesus or I'm going to kill you. She went to preaching like never before, like a wild woman. He steps out from, his, from that chair, I guess they had chairs, and walks down on that dirt floor gets on stage and pulls out a pistol and puts it to her head. She says, he said, you say that name one more time. I'm going to kill you right here. Now, I don't remember exactly the words she said, but I remember it was something like this. As soon as he was about to pull that trigger, she yelled out something like, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. She yelled out that there was no other God but her God. She began speaking, and as she did, she said that man began to shake. She felt that cold metal touching her head, and it was vibrating. It, it wasn't like it was a few seconds ago. She, the man dropped the, the, uh, the pistol to the floor. He got down on his knees and says, Tell me about that Jesus. I've got to be saved today. The story didn't end there. 
She said, within a few weeks, that man said, you need you an air-conditioned building. I'm turning over my strip club, my bar. It's going to become a church. You go fix it however you need to fix it up. It's yours. She said she went down there. They finished out their revival in air conditioning. God moved, changed that place, shut down the business. She went back to her hometown where she was a pastor, and she said the man closed his business, moved to her town, and supported her with tithes, offerings, and attendance. Ha-ha! God be the glory. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. My Lord. I'm going to try not to look at my watch. I might feel like I've got to cut it off here. Okay. What else happens when God moves in a church? Drug addicts become clean instruments of righteousness. People who are addicted get set free. Those who have been lost and undone, who have lived the life that is wrong and sinful, Turn around because Jesus Christ washes them with his blood. These are the type results that should be happening in your community when you are a thriving church with the anointing of God's spirit upon you. What else did God say to the Israelites? And has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. Now, how does that relate to today? Because the demons that you fight against outweigh you, outpower you, I guess you could say. They're, they're stronger than you on every front. There's nothing in your flesh you could do to ever whoop a demon. I mean, they'd laugh at you. Matter of fact, that's pretty much what happened to the seven sons of Sceva. They went up, they said, oh, we rebuke you. We cast you out in the name of Jesus. This is during uh, uh, the time of the New Testament. And, and the Bible says that demon-possessed man stripped off the clothes of every, seven, one, every one of the seven brothers and they went running off because they were trying to counter and attack a devil without Jesus on the inside. Demons are not scared of us. The devil's not scared of you as far as in the flesh. But here's the good news. God said he's given you the power to trample serpents and scorpions to cast out Devils. Now that tells me there must be a power within me that I'm going to get into tonight. There must be a power within me that's bigger than myself. It's the power of God. And when that power is within you, now that the devil doesn't see you, but the devil sees God in you, those demons now tremble. That's the kind of power you've got. Though they may be superior in intellect, the God in you created them so he knows about a billion more uh, things than they do and then multiply that times about 100,000. <laughs> they can't get one up on God. Verse 2, And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. I don't know if this scripture will be on the PowerPoint, but it's 1 John 3 and 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might, somebody say, destroy. Destroy the works of the devil. You know, one reason, Brother Randy, I like that word. Because that means after God gets through with the devil's plans, all that's left is just some rubble in the background. All that's left is just the aftermath of an atomic bomb of Holy Ghost anointed power that hits the devil's strongholds, and he don't have anything to show for it except for ashes in the aftermath. Oh, hallelujah. Woo. Well, at least there's a few getting excited about that. He said he came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus wants you to become so powerful in him that with his power in you, you destroy the strongholds of Satan in your community. God went on to say, you shall make no covenant with them. Church, negotiations with Satan have officially ended. They're over. No more negotiating, no more trying to uh, give a little, take a little, no more compromise. Because now that we realize the power within us, we find out we can stand up from the negotiating table, walk away, and laugh. Because the devil has nothing to offer us that we want or need. God's got everything we could ever need. Negotiations are over. Quit tiptoeing around spiritual warfare. Quit acting like you're not strong enough to rebuke the devil. If Christ is in you, you've got the ability to get on your knees and pray and rebuke the powers of Satan. Amen? You're anointed to pray. 
You're anointed to overcome the devil. You're anointed to break strongholds. My Lord, somebody better get a hold of this. You're anointed to come against every principality and power of darkness and of the air and to cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I said you're anointed by the Holy Ghost to defeat the devil that's coming against your life. You are anointed as a child of the Most High God. Walk away from the negotiating table. He said, show them no mercy, nor show mercy to them, he said. We've been so conditioned by rooting for the rebel. We've been so conditioned that everything seems to be wrong now. They're, they're scared to death to put people to sleep. You probably heard about that in the last couple of years, that lethal injection. Oh, it was such a horrible thing. I'm thinking, man, all you do is putting them to sleep. And they're dying. It was capital punishment. I mean, I remember the old days of the electric chair. Come on, somebody. Remember the gas chamber? I, I wasn't ever in it personally, but I, I remember the stories, and it'd take your breath, and it'd kill you. Now I thought, well, that's pretty humane. If they're going to kill somebody, at least they put them to sleep first. But yet, we, we're conditioned nowadays that everything's wrong. Root for the wrong people. Root for the criminals. And they deserve better. Man, they've already got cable TV, watching football on Saturdays, popcorn, snicker bar, Dr. Pepper, bring hot dogs, hamburgers. I'm thinking, man, what else we got to do for the prisoners? Amen. Come on, somebody. Say, go ahead and preach the word, Pastor. Let's move on. He said, show no mercy to them. Some people treat the devil like America treats its prisoners. Now, in some ways, I'm, I'm glad that they don't mistreat prisoners in America. But what I'm saying is sometimes I think they got it too good because I've been told stories over in Atala where there's a couple of drunks that show up every weekend because they know it's a free meal and a bed to sleep on. You know what that tells me? They've got it too good. I've been intoxicated publicly. Take me in. Well, all we're going to do is feed you, give you cable TV and lock you up and let you sit on a padded bed with a pillow. I mean, think about it. Now, some people say, well, you're kind of going overboard about that. I'm, I'm emphasizing this fact because I want you to see the church has gained that same mentality and applied it to the devil. We said, well, as long as we can kind of keep him in a, a quiet place over there and, and let him have some souls, let him have certain members of my family, they're always going to be that way. Can I preach right here? There's going to be a, that uncle that's always going to curse God. He's always going to use all them bad words. He's, I, I'm always going to have this uh, cousin over here who's sleeping around with everybody. Let's just let it be so that the Christian group of our family can all get along and talk about Jesus. But see, God's tired of, we, uh, of us treating the devil like we do prisoners and saying if we can just keep them comfortable, then everything will be smoother. No, God's called you to go to war for your cousin. I got a cousin right now on his way to hell, and I've got to go to war for him in the name of Jesus. Richard, don't be offended, but I went to war for you as, as well as hundreds of other people. There was a time when Richard, raise your hand. There was a time when Richard Jeffers was on his way to hell. He wasn't living for the Lord. He wasn't saved. I hope it don't bother you children me saying this, but he wasn't, he wasn't living for the Lord. And I remember a time where God would come upon many of us and we would get on our face and cry out and plead the blood of Jesus for his soul. You know what we did? We didn't say, well, let Richard just keep living the way he wants and, and that way it won't upset the devil and maybe I won't get attacked with sickness and maybe I won't have my finances attacked because I'm going to let the devil keep the ones that he's already got. No, I couldn't do that and you couldn't either. We had to get on our face and plead the blood against every demon and devil. Richard and most of you would not be here today if somebody had not prayed a prayer of faith and pulled you away from the gates of hell itself and rebuked the devil that had you deceived. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody pulled you out. We've got to quit treating the devil like a good American prisoner and go to war until he is blasted so far away from our family members that he won't ever want to touch them again because he knows if he gets within 50 feet of him we're going to start speaking that name again that gets on his nerves we're going to start praying against him in the name above all names in the name of Jesus somebody's got to get an attitude of warfare again in the kingdom he said nor shall you make marriages with them you shall not give your daughter to their son nor take their daughter for your son you've got a duty to protect your family Amen. God saved you. Now you fight the good fight of faith for your kids. Fight the good fight of faith for your spouse. Fight it for your parents. God's going to win them to him in Jesus' name. For I am persuaded, verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, 
nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stand with me, please. There's a woman, I know this name's going to sound funny to you, but her name's Let Let Win. Let Let Win in Burma. It's a true story. This story comes from a Church of God missions testimony. God saved this woman. I believe it was a missionary who went to her, her city. She believed in Christ and accepted him as, his, as her Savior. And her family was of a different religion. I think she said they were uh, Buddhist, I believe. And all kinds of persecution started hitting her. And she had to live by faith on this scripture I just read. Shall trouble, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, shall it separate us? She lived by faith. She made up her mind, I'm going to live for Jesus no matter who likes it and who don't. They started accusing her of being a prostitute, just lying on her, trying to get her thrown in jail, trying to get her killed. She kept living for the Lord day after day after day. She said, God, you got to do something to wake up my community. She had two cows that she needed to sell. The most that anybody in that community had ever gotten for a cow <clears throat> as far as selling it was $800. $800, remember that. Had two of them. The most she would possibly gain would be $1,600. So here she goes off to the market taking those two cows saying, God, you got to do something. You got to do something. You got to wake up my city. You got to save my family. God, you got to intervene. She comes back from the market with $2,200. The town's just like, whoa. Her tribe, her community, her family saying, wait a minute, there might be something to this God you're telling us about. Nobody's ever gained that much money from the sale of cows. That's a miracle. Time went by. God started moving in her family. Started getting a little closer to wanting to serve the Lord, but they weren't quite ready. She said uh, there was a famine that hit that land in Burma. And all she knew to do was take what little she had, like the, the woman that, Eli, I believe it was Elisha. He said, you just bake me a cake. All she knew to do was take care of her own family and minister to the man of God. She said, I'd take my little bit of rice every day and I'd make our meal, which most meals were made out of rice there. And then she said, I'd take a meal to the pastor and his wife. Oh, <laughs> woo! Everybody started running out of rice, and they said, but wait a minute, every time uh, let, let wind goes back to the cupboard, there's another bowl of rice. They said, wait, this don't make sense. You, done, you used up everything that you had. You fed your family. Now you're, you're feeding the pastor and his wife every day, and you've still got more. She said, God just kept multiplying it. Every day she opened up that cupboard again. There it was. Mm, more rice, more food, more meal. The man of God was going to be taken care of, and so was her family. She said revival hit. Something happened in that community. People said, wait, this cannot be happening in the natural. It's got to be real. Her God must be the God of the universe. She said her whole family got saved. They had a church, about 15 people that uh, rose up. People started uh, coming together, worshiping. And as far as I know, people just keep getting saved. But as of the time of this story, there were over 15 just, just like that got right with Jesus. God's made you to be more than a conqueror, but he didn't tell you there wouldn't be any persecution. This woman had to, be, had to go through times of being called a prostitute, and she was a holy woman of God. Reputation tarnished, but she just kept fighting the good fight. Oh, glory to God. Does anybody feel what I feel? She kept fighting the good fight of faith. People talked about her. She kept loving them. People was trying to take her out uh, to kill her. She kept praying for them. It's one thing to pray for your family, but it's another to pray for people who hate your guts and want you to, your reputation to be destroyed. That's harder to pray for those kind of people, but that's when God really starts moving on your behalf. When you pray for people you wish would just fall off the earth and die, but you change and you let go of that grudge and you say, Dear God, I'm going to forgive them and love them and pray for them, it'll amaze you what will happen in your life. You are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. I want to leave you with this thought. The scripture did not say that you are more than a conqueror after you make it through all these things. Here's a key. You're going to need it. He said you would be conquerors in all these things. 
Not after the battle's over. He said, you're more than conquerors in all these things. Think about that. Because that means even in the middle of it, you're already a champion in the eyes of God. Even when you lost your temper last week, you were already a champion in the eyes of God. He saw this week. Even when you was cussing a few weeks ago, God looked at you and said, oh, but I'm going to clean them up. They're going to start talking with holy words and righteousness. Even when you were in your addiction and you, you hated your sin and you said, I, I said I'd never do this again, but God, here I am praying the same prayer I prayed for the last 15 years. My God, he's talking to somebody. Even in the midst of addiction, God looked at you and he saw overcomer. He saw champion. He saw a giant killer because he knew who he was going to cause you to become if you just let him. God sees the person that he can help you to be. You're already that person. He's just waiting on you to get there. <laughs> You're more than conquerors. Your, your victory goes beyond today's battle. It goes beyond last week's failure. You're more than a conqueror. There's already battles that some kids are about to face in the coming school year. They have no idea they're going to get hit with. But God sent your pastor to tell you these words, young people that are still students. You're already more than a conqueror. Can I get a little frank with you? I'm not looking at my watch, so I ain't worried about it. If you got to go, go. Can I get frank? There's going to be some young people in this church that are about to be faced with the first time ever of being sexually active. First time ever. They've never done anything sexual with a boy or girl. They're about to be hit with those temptations. When mom and daddy's not there to rescue you, not there to talk you out of it, you're going to be facing some sexual situations. And this morning, God gave your pastor a word to speak over you. You're already more than a conqueror. Some would say, well, what if I fail, Pastor? Won't God forgive me? Well, absolutely, He'll forgive you. But here's the thing. Why have a mentality of a failure? Why look at it like, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and fail anyway because I know He'll forgive me. Why trample the grace of God? Why not be what He called you to be? Why not be a warrior of the faith? Why not pull out the sword every once in a while instead of making sure it's shiny, make sure it still cuts those devils through and through? Because that's who you've got to be in these last days. You ain't got time to fail like mom and daddy and your grandparents did. You ain't got time to play games and wait till you hit 25 till you get uh, anointed by God and start working in ministry. You've got to move now. God's called you now. You don't have the time that I had when I was a kid. You've got to move now. My Lord, I feel a shift in the service. I'm going to put it on you, young people. Here it is. If you love Jesus, there it is. I hit you with it. If you love Jesus more than the world, I want you to come stand up here and face me. If you, I'm talking 19 and under, 19 and under. If you love Jesus, that's going to make some people feel weird if they don't come out. I don't, I mean, I don't want people to be uncomfortable, but I, I want to get real strong with you today because I feel the Lord's moving strong. If you love Jesus more than the world, you're 19 and under, I want you up here. Somebody give God a hand. Spirit, you're welcome here. What you're seeing in front of you right now, church, we see them as young people. We see them as still in the stage of maturing. God sees valiant warriors. He sees young people who are about to change their schools if they will walk in His will. You're seeing young people who are about to become missionaries in the classroom. They're going to say words they didn't even know they knew. But it's because they're going to ask God to anoint their mouths and their minds. And God's going to save some of their classmates. Mm, Lord, direct us right now. Colton, Brother Gary, Brother 
Brother John, any other ministers, y'all want to come up and help us pray? Y'all just make your way up here. I probably overlooked some people. I'm sorry if I did. Y'all just start down there with Matthew. Let the Spirit of God just move through you as you pray. We're going to pray a special anointing on them for whatever they face. Matthew's already graduated, but he's got co-workers and stuff that he's going to need to influence. Come on, Lord. Young people, if you'll be so kind, just stay up here until we're through praying. I appreciate that. Tasted and seen. 